We're going to take a moment so that God can deal with, with us and keep us on the right ground for what he wants in our own hearts so we'll be prepared. Amen? That's what discipleship is. It's discipline, discipline of the spirit, not just discipline uh, in disciplining your life. As I've said before, you can meet someone who's very disciplined for all kinds of reasons. Some people are disciplined just because they don't want to make a mistake. Some people are disciplined because they're just lean that way or they like everything just perfectly or nice, which these things aren't wrong. Our people, some people are disciplined because they have a vision, they have a purpose, whether it's business or their career or relationship or something. But we as Christians, we're, we're disciples and we're disciplined in the spirit to give God what he wants. Amen? And that puts everything on a completely different ground. I've known men very disciplined who yet really don't have controls over their own hearts, and it's because they don't have the discipline of the Spirit. And so God brings that discipline to us again and again. Now, there was a word a while back that said truth is coming. And I think it's something we should talk about this morning because we're living in a time of increasing lies. And we know that Satan is the father of lies. But never, especially in this country, have there's been a time where so many lies have been propagated. So many lies. Road versus ways, as you know now, if you know your, some of your history was, ber- was based on a lie, is based upon a lie. All these things that come about that were based on lies. And Satan is the father of lies. But God said truth is coming. What does that really look like? What does it really mean in our own lives that truth is coming? I want to read you quite a few scriptures if you'll follow with me this morning. Psalms 15 says, the Lord, Lord, it's a question, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who will dwell in your holy hill? He that walks uprightly works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up reproach against his neighbor. Who's going to dwell in 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 the Lord's holy hill? He that speaks the truth where? In his heart, in his heart. Do you speak the truth in your heart? It takes a a brave man or brave woman to speak the truth in their hearts. And the deep recesses of your heart to say, this is the truth, Lord. Psalm 43, 3 says, so send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me into the holy, into your holy hill and your tabernacle. So he that speaks the truth in his heart dwells in the holy hill. And here's David's prayer, the psalmist's prayer. Send out your what? Your light and your truth. We're going to see those things are, are linked. Light and truth are linked. Then David cries out in Psalm 51, the psalm of repentance. And he said, behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. Now David, if you look at his life, he's an Old Testament man, but he was an inward man. He was a man who walked with an, in, an inward life, the inward life. He was not a New Testament man. They did, not have maybe the, they did not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as we speak of it today. But David was a man who knew, Lord, you did not desire sacrifice and offerings. The blood of bulls will never appease you. This is when he's repenting of his time, his sin with Bathsheba and his great fall. But he knows, God, all, all this comes down to this. You want truth in the inward parts. David realized this. You want truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts, you'll make me to know wisdom. We're in the hidden parts. Psalm 85.10 says, Mercy and truth are met together. I love the poeticness of the King James. It says, Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Mercy and truth, righteousness and peace have come together. Proverbs were, were encouraged to buy the truth and sell it not. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding to buy the truth. It literally means to purchase it. You need to purchase the truth with what? Purchase the truth with denying yourself. Purchase the truth with with taking the pain of saying, God, I want the truth no matter what. In my inward parts, God, speak to me. God, deal with me. God, show me. Reveal to me what you want. In Psalm 16, it says, By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. In the fear of the Lord, men depart evil. 
by mercy and truth. These things are linked together. Then in Isaiah, we begin to see what I think is describing the days we live in. Isaiah 59, 14 says, None calls for justice, nor any pleads for truth. They trust in vanity and speaks lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. And again, if you drop down to verse 13, it says, In transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood, and judgment is turned away backwards. Justice stands afar off. Truth is fallen in the streets. Equity cannot enter. Yea, truth falls. And he that departs from evil makes himself a prey, and the Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no judgment. We'll come back to that, but I'll continue on with Jeremiah 5, 1. Run, run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and see now, and know and seek in the broad places. Therefore, if you can find a man, if there be any that executes judgment, that seeks the truth, and I'll pardon it. God's saying, go through Jerusalem. He's telling Jeremiah, go through the city. If you can find one man that really seeks the truth, I'll pardon it. Couldn't find one man. We wonder one time, times it's like God's judgment and they go into to captivity. It's not because God just had a, a, a quick reaction against their sin. He came to a point where Jeremiah couldn't find a man. And though they say the Lord lives, surely they swear falsely. O oh Lord, are not your eyes upon the truth? You have stricken them, but they have not grieved. You consumed them, but they, have not, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than rocks. They have refused to return. Jeremiah 7, 28, But thou shalt say unto them, This is a nation that obeys not the voice of the Lord God, nor receive his correction. Truth is perished and is cut off from their mouths. This is where we're living today. Yes, we're living in a, in a nation, in a time where truth has fallen in the streets, where justice is turned around backwards. And I want to be clear what we're talking about when we're talking about a light and truth. We're just not talking about the truth of conservative truth against li uh, liberal truth and so on and so forth. We're talking, about, we're talking about the truth of God. And things are turned around backwards. And this is, the, this is the atmosphere we live in. It takes real strength to walk in the society we're walking in, in truth and in light. People have been taught to believe lies. They've been taught to believe lies. From the earliest age in our school system, they're, they're taught all the lies. The world's going to end in, in 12 years, and, and guilt and shame is put on everyone. We've turned, we've turned the justice and the, the life of God around backwards, calling men women and women men. Jeremiah 9 says, They bend their tongues like the bow for lies, but they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, says the Lord. We need ones that are valiant for the truth. And once again, we're talking about truth. We're not talking about just what's right or what we consider right. We're not talking about just fighting for doctrinal things. There's something God wants from his church, and it's not simply to stand up in a reformation way, which is important, and say these are the laws of God and these are the laws you're breaking. There's, that's, that, there's truth in that. But what God needs at this time is real life. He needs real life, light and truth in the believers to stand forth. It just goes on and on. They deceive everyone his neighbor. They do not speak the truth. They have taught their tongues to speak lies. They weary themselves to commit iniquity. Now, I know it's tough to read these scriptures and go about them. I'm telling you again not to, not to dark grass and be the old guy who's talking about the past, but, but these are the scriptures I grew up on. These are the messages I heard preachers thundering about 40 years ago, thundering these messages right here for America. And we would spend our evenings in tears and in prayer and weeping. And now we're in a time where this has taken effect. We were sowing back then. America was sowing. The nation was sowing. And we were praying. And now the crop is coming in. And, and believers find themselves wading through the crop, not knowing what to do. As I said, for years and years, I, I cried out with the message. It was like, Lord, we heal superficially. We heal superficially. My heart was broken. And then there came a point where the Lord, I said, Lord, why isn't the fire burning for that message anymore? And he showed me because it's already happened. They've healed superficially. Now you've got to roll up your sleeves, stop, and try and, and bring the healing that God needs. Amen? Which is what Anthony was sharing with the brothers in, in Isaiah 58. 
And years ago when I preached on the message of Jezebel and would talk about, about men be, be getting back to the right place, about putting the family in the right place and all this, so many times, at, at times I thought, Lord, I, it's too much. I'm too much. People like you focus too much on this, but I could see the destruction of the family. I could see that, that, that virtue and all that was falling. Who ever thought we'd be in a day where we are now, where people, people actually put into offices in our country are men who are wearing dresses like women. And they're leading our country. It's a tough, it's difficult. I even knew years ago, because I was a young man and I'd be invited because I had a, a powerful testimony, I'd be invited to youth groups and different churches and going, I'd know at the time, Lord, we're not giving these young people the things that they need. We're teaching them lightly and teaching them how to play. We're teaching them all the wrong things. Because they're going to grow up into a generation. When we'd listen to, to Brother Ravenhill preach and he'd say, you may have the privilege, some of you young ones that are here, you may have the privilege to be in prison for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, that's the day we're in now. Some of, some of us may most definitely find ourselves going to jail. Not for a truth, but for life, for the truth of God. In Hosea, it says, Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land because there is no truth, no mercy, no knowledge of God in the land. We wonder why today there's so much offense in the country that everyone's offended, every minority is offended, half the population is, is offended. I, uh, we heard, was it the mayor of New York said, half the population is being abused, meaning women, like all, all, all women are now. Did you women know that? You're now a minority, right? Because everybody's offended. And we're offended because we lost Christianity. We lost the foundations of forgiveness, amen? We lost it. There's no forgiveness, so everyone's offended. What did Jesus say? Listen to these words of Jesus in John 8, 44. He looks at the Pharisees and says, you're of, the father, you're of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Wow. Can you imagine that? What a message Jesus had. And he's talking to religious leaders. He didn't say, listen, you're a little off. He didn't say, listen, you, you know, we just need to talk a little while. You know, you know go to, this, go to this, this, this webinar and watch. He looked at them and told them the truth. He says, you're of the father of the devil. He knew if you're not saved and you're walking in religion, you're of your father the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. And he bowed not in the truth because there's no truth in him. Do you see that that's where we're, what's happening today? Do you see that the, Satan is the father of lies? Is that right? There's no truth in him. There's no light in him. And the more he gets exposed, the more he has his way, what happens? Lies. He wants to keep deception. He wants to keep lies going. Because Satan doesn't like two things to happen. He doesn't like it when righteousness breaks forth. He doesn't like it when light breaks forth. And he also doesn't like it just when pure evil breaks forth before it's time. Because it makes people think. He likes everything just to be deceived. That's why he tries to lie as us, the believers. He tries to cover us with guilt and shame. He tries to bring the lies against us. Amen? We see the glory of the gospel. You wonder why the church isn't so excited about the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. It's because Satan tries to bring so many lies. Know this. Hell is as hot and as awful and as, as terrible as you can imagine. And heaven is, is, is glorious and, and more glorious than you could ever imagine. That you truly, you, when you were lost, you were lost, you were damned, you were without God. It was that bad. But know this, the truth, that when you're saved, it's absolutely that, that wonderful, that glorious. And we don't have that dividing line as clear as we should in our lives. But it's coming. Jesus was very clear to them. He spoke to them the truth in John before, a few verses before that. He says, but now you seek to kill me, a man that told you the truth. Paul said these very words in Galatians 4, 16, when he says, I'm therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth. 
When we speak the truth, many times we're not, it's not very popular, is it? People don't want the light shining in it. In Romans, we see where we're living today. It says, who changed the truth for a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Is that not what we're doing today? A lot of the church needs to be careful, even about all this environmental stuff. And I know I get in trouble with it. It's like, no, Brother Frank, you know, as Christians, we have to be good steward and all that. It's like, listen, forget all that. It's a bunch of garbage. And I'll tell you why. Because we're not on the ground of stewardship. It's not a ground of stewardship. It's a ground of this. You're worshiping the creature more than the creator. I understand stewardship. I understand ownership. I understand we need to take care of what God gives us. But I'll not step in and, and put, put one arm around, around what the world has to say and one arm around God. I do not worship Mother Earth. I worship my Father God. And we worship the creature more than the creator. So the church wanting, and me and you sometimes wanting just to say, well, I don't want to come off as seem like I'm crazy. It's like too, it's too bad we have to let the light and the truth shine. Let's come off as crazy. This is the way it is. Walk with Jesus, and then you'll understand stewardship. It gets a little worse then before we can turn a corner here. Are you with me? In 2 Thessalonians 2.9, sorry. God sends upon them, therefore, the full... I'm reading, if, if you'll let, allow me, I'm going to read the J.B. Phillips because it's a very good translation for here in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 11. But God sends upon them, therefore, the full force of evil's delusion so that they put their faith in an utter fraud and meet the inevitable judgment of all who have refused to believe the truth, who have made evil their playfellow. In other words, in this Thessalonian, the King James, it says... God sends them a strong delusion because they love not the truth. That's where we are today. The lie is becoming so strong because they didn't love the truth. Do you love the truth this morning? We're believers. We should love the truth. We should have no fear of the truth. And then, one of my favorite portions of Scripture in John 18, 37. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art Thou a king then. Jesus answered, You say that I'm a king. To this end I was born. And for this cause I came into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. Now I want you to get the picture here. This Pilate, he represents the world. He represents the world's authority. Based on a lie. He's standing there thinking, I have the power of life and death over this man. Not realizing he has no power over life and death of this man. He's a pawn in Satan's scheme. And the religious leader, all, they're all outside. They've all turned Jesus over. Thinking that they're doing God's work. And yet, here's the king of glory. Here's the king of glory. Being judged by the world. Bearing our sins. And then Pilate looks at him and says, what is truth? What is truth? And yet truth was standing right in front of him. You see, this is where we've got to see. Truth isn't just our, our list of doctrines, right? Like on our website, we definitely clear said, this is what the well believes. We want to be clear about that. These are our doctrinal truths. These are the things that we believe. So you can, you can see them. But it also says we believe that a believer should live what he believes in the life of Jesus. Truth is not just a set of rules. Truth is not just doctrine. Truth is just not what the creed of Christianity. Truth is Jesus Christ himself. He is the truth. He says, I am the way. I am the life. I am the truth. Without him, there's no knowing. Without him, there's no going. Without him, there's no living. Can you imagine this scene? There he stands before Pilate. He's been abused. He's been mocked. He's on his way to sacrifice himself for the sins of the world. The power of the world is judging him. The power of religion is rejecting him. And yet he's standing there. And Pilate says, what is truth? It's all vague. And truth was standing in front of him. And he could not see it. 
We're familiar with the scripture when the Pharisees were talking to Jesus. And he says, you search the scriptures because in them you think is eternal life. How is it possible for men to live their lives searching the scriptures? They search the scriptures. You know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a good Catholic Italian boy. So when I grew up, we were told not to read the Bible. We didn't read the Bible. We didn't know anything about scriptures. So when I first got saved, I thought anybody who read their Bible had to see Jesus, right? This had been kept from me. The scriptures, the fact that God died for me. I never could have believed the first time I was in a church that talked about salvation and read the scripture and was dead as a doornail. It shocked me. I was like, how is this possible? I wanted to look around and shout at everybody and said, what's wrong with y'all? Can't you see the words? Are y'all dead? And they were. I didn't think it was possible. But Jesus looks at these Pharisees and they're reading and searching the scriptures. He says, you think you have an eternal life, but they speak of me. They speak of me. You should see Jesus in Genesis and Jesus in Leviticus and Jesus in Numbers. Jesus and Joshua, the prince that takes over the, the things. You should see Jesus all the way you go. Jesus and Jeremiah is the prophet. Jesus and Hosea is the loving husband who never turns anyone away. Jesus and in, in, in Malachi, the one who will bring the prophet. Jesus and Zephaniah and Zechariah, the, the, the rebuilder. Jesus in the book of Matthew. Jesus in the, in the book of Mark is the, is, the, is the son of man. Jesus in the book of John is the son of God. Jesus in Galatians and Ephesians, Philippians and Colossians is the builder of the churches. Jesus and Timothy are the ones who will raise up the leaders. Jesus in the book of Revelation is the soon and coming king. Everywhere you look, you should see Jesus. That's why when I meet believers and, and all they talk about is this doctrine or that doctrine, I'm always talking like, can't we talk about Jesus? Standing in front of Pilate was the truth. The truth. And, and I don't get me wrong, there, there are many that are standing politically, socially, morally, and all for truths with a, with a plural. And that's important. But for the church of Jesus Christ, we have to have the truth, which is Jesus. Amen? The truth. That's the bad news. The bad news is truth has fallen in the streets. The bad news, when someone turns to righteousness, they become a prey. Have, are you seeing that now? Anybody who's going to stand up for the truth and for Jesus, they're going to become a prey. Right? Anybody. It's fallen in the streets. Justice is turned around backwards. It can be very frustrating, can it not? It can be very upsetting. But the truth is going to win out, Amen. So what about now? What about now? In Zechariah 8, 3, it says, Thus says the Lord, I am returned unto Zion. I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem will be called a city of what? Truth. And the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain, the city of truth. Is that not what God's building? In all the lies that are going on, in all the deception that is going on, in everything that's being propagated as Satan stands up more and more and more and more, God's going to build a city of truth right in the midst of it. In John 1, 17, it says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. What came by Jesus Christ? Grace and what? Truth. Because those things are what? Met together. See, this is the liberating, liberating power of truth. This is the power of truth that David knew when he prayed, God, you want truth in the inward parts. David didn't just want to cover up his sin that he committed with Bathsheba and, and the murder of her husband. David just didn't want to repent so he could continue being king. David just didn't want, to, didn't want to just try to appease something. David wanted to know what went wrong inside of me. What's the truth deep down inside of me? We get a glimpse of it when, when, when uh, Nathaniel looks at him and says, tells him the parable of the man who who had all these sheep, and then he goes, takes the little sheep out of the man who held the little lamb in his bosom, and he took it away from him. Exposed David's heart, because David said, the man deserves to die. But David had mercy and said, he has to pay back seven times. Nathaniel said, you're the man. In other words, what Nathaniel was saying is, God's given you all this. Something's wrong in your heart. You have everything you could want. Did you get tired of fighting, David? You have riches. You have, you have wives, you have everything, and yet you want to go take somebody's little lamb. This went so much deeper than simply adultery or even murder. It went to the very reasons of it. Because when truth comes for the believer, 
What's, what's, what is married with truth? Mercy and grace. Mercy and grace. John 4.20 says, But the hour coming is now when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in what? In spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship Him. Who does God seek to worship Him? Those who are just worshiping in truth, we're right. We're the church of being right. You know, I'm right. Those believers are wrong. We worship the right way. That's not the Spirit of God. Nor is it just saying we worship in the, in the, in, in tru, in the Spirit and there's just all this so-called stuff of the Spirit goes on and no grounding in the truth. They worship in spirit and in truth. Amen? How beautiful is that? If you just dwell on that for a little while, we won't park here for very long, but it's so beautiful. You have the truth. There's the truth. There's the solidity and the foundation of the truth of God, and yet there's the Spirit. Amen? God is a Spirit, and they worship Him, must worship Him in Spirit and in truth. And, of course, John 8, often quoted, often quoted. John 8, 32, and you'll know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Why would, the, why would the truth make you free? Do you see? Think about this. The more lies covers everything. The more lies cover everything. The more hiding people hide. The more striving, the more justifying of their own hearts. The more this goes on layer upon layer. You know, lies beget lies beget lies beget lies beget lies. Till people are hiding. This is what it means when it says in, in Isaiah 58 to see those people that are free. When it says in other scriptures that, that they hide in, in prison caves and, and they need to be set free. Why? Because they're hiding. Like when Adam did and God says, where are you, Adam? And he was hiding among the trees. People hide more than ever. But Jesus says, you'll know the truth. When the truth comes, when the light shines... What happens? Freedom. Freedom. Freedom comes. We shouldn't be afraid of God speaking to us. God, send me a dream. God, send me a word. God, God, put a brother, sister in my life that loves me to speak the truth. God, in a meeting, speak to my heart. You look at the scriptures. You look at all through it. The woman, the woman that fell at his feet, caught in adultery. What happened to her? The truth did what? It set her free. She was free. What about Mary Magdalene? The truth set her free. What about the woman that was at the well? She had had five husbands. Instead of going off in shame and covered and people pointing and laughing, she was free. She was free. She was free. The tax collector was free. They were free. Peter was free. The truth came. Jesus said, I'll pray. I'll pray for you that your faith fail not. His heart was exposed. That the flesh was weak even though the spirit was willing. And he denied the Lord, but the truth came and set him free. You see, we can't go out there and simply use the truth to beat people up. Just show a man, expose a man's heart and show him who he really is and he'll wind up in the gutter. Why do you think drugs are so prevalent? You know, you become, people become careless when their lives when they begin to give up hope. And what a hopeless generation we have. They're told from the time they're five years old, life will never be good. Life of the world will end in 12 years. Polar bears are going to fall over dead and it's your fault. What happened in America 50 years ago, 100 years ago, it's all your fault. If you're a man, it's like you're, you might as well go and hide yourself because women have been done so bad. You just forget it. And for so many women, because they're not treated with the respect and love and honor that they should have, they just give up and live any kind of lifestyle. That's the root, root of sexual immorality. It's the root of all the drug problems and all the, the opioid epidemic then we're in because people don't have hope. And if you just show people the truth, what we consider the truth, just showing a man who he is, without the full truth of Jesus Christ, he winds up in the gutter. But when the truth and the light comes and a man sees that he's a sinner before God, and that Jesus is there. When she looked up, there was no accusers there, only Jesus. Liberty. How many backsliders, I've said it so many times, even in the city, how many backsliders and Christians that, are, that have quit out there? How many are out there? God will never take me back. I have failed. It will never be the same. Nothing will ever work again. I've sinned my grace away. They're all lies, 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 lies. Amen? God longs to take them back. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. 
We need Jesus in our midst again. This is why you must seek Jesus. You must get into his presence. You must have time with him. With the word, yes. In prayer, yes. But he needs to be there. You're struggling with the brother or sister. You're struggling with the situation. You're struggling with your own heart. You have to get into his presence where you let go of everything and you don't try to figure it out and you say, God, but as for me, I'll come into your presence in the abundance of your mercy. I'm going to come into your presence. Then you can show me the truth and it'll set you free. This is what's binding you. This is the lie that's binding you. This is the bitterness that's binding you. This is what, the way you think that's binding you. And all of a sudden the truth comes. It's like, okay. We miss that so many times. Oh, how long for that. To have meetings again where the conviction of the Lord comes and people are set free. I'm telling you it's possible. It's possible. I've seen meetings where the conviction of the Lord comes so hard. There's tears. There's broken hearts. And yet, and yet as people begin to turn to what God is saying, liberty and freedom begins to come. You see, as, as, as men, we want to be right. Is that not right? We want to be right. So we take the truth and try to be right. Even in our preaching, we want to be right. God doesn't want us to be right. He wants us to be righteous. We strive some more for what is right. This is what's happening even in the country. Is there are those who are fighting for what's right, and that's good, but it just becomes a battle. To them just trying to fight the lies, and what we need is Jesus Christ walking in our midst. John 14, 17 says, Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knows him, but we know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. What is he called? The spirit of truth. When the Holy Spirit is there, what's going on? Truth. Truth. This is what humbles us, amen? Because he's the truth. Sanctify them, Jesus prayed, through truth. Your word is truth. In Ephesians the apostle encourages them, but speaking the truth in love that you may grow up in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Speak the truth in love. Why? So that you're right. Speak the truth so that you're right. You know, Oswald Chambers said, sometimes if you have to speak, you're driven. You, 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 you want to speak. You want to speak. He said, sometimes you need to check that and say, is this really the Lord? And other times when you don't want to speak and you're, you're trying to keep yourself quiet and you need to check that, maybe the Lord wants you to speak. So many times we want to speak because we want to be right. Or so many times we want to be quiet because we don't want to be misunderstood. But we have to speak the truth in love. Why? That we may grow up into all things which is the head into Christ. Every time you're speaking the truth in the church, it's so that people are what? Edified. Edified. See, it's all about motivation. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what's your motivations for speaking? Maybe it's a love and you're, you're being sympathetic. Or maybe you say it's love, but, but you're using it to hurt an individual or group that you're speaking to. You see, it has to be that abiding, abiding love of God is why you speak. And that's just not a cliche that says, well, brother, you have to speak the truth in love, meaning you can never hurt anybody's feelings. Listen, you, it very, very well hurts somebody's feelings. But what's your motivation for speaking? Your motivation for speaking is always, always, to bring Christ into view. Always. We've lost so much of this, and once again, it all, much of it goes right back to the very root of our society. Where parenthood is all about just, just doing the best for your kids, providing the best, correcting them so that you have a nice life, instead of saying, God, I've got to lead my family, correct my children for the betterment of what you want, Jesus. For, for their betterment, for true love for them. We've heard it says standing fast, having your loins girded about with truth. That's where our strength comes from. In John, 1 John chapter 1, and these things I write unto you that your joy, listen, there's that joy again, that your joy may be full. This then is the message that you heard of him, that he declared unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, we walk in darkness. 
If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness and we lie and do not have the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ. His son cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Here John is saying he wants your joy to be full. And how is our joy being full? That we recognize that God is what? He's light. Do you understand that? In him is no darkness. And if we walk in the light as he's in the light. Now, you think about this. We're living in a time of darkness. Is that right? We're moving into the dark ages in America. Really, we are in a lot of ways. So the darkness is all around more and more. But God is saying he wants to, us to walk in the light. Now, here, here, here is, here's some good news. The more darkness there is, when the light shines, it has a powerful effect, doesn't it? It has a very powerful effect. For the longest time in America, and especially down here in the Bible South, it's been very gray. You can't tell sometimes the difference between the world and the church and everything's so gray. But the more the light shines, the more persecution will increase, but the more people will be affected by the light. We're used to walking in a room that's dimly lit and we just throw on another lamp and it brightens up a little bit and people are like, it's a little brighter. But you walk into a dark room and you throw that light on, people are going to know it. And this is where God wants us to be. He wants us to walk in that light and that truth. For us, he wants us to be like David and said, Lord, shine that light in my heart. We have nothing to fear, brothers and sisters, nothing to fear. Your God loves you. Your God loves you. We're so afraid. I could be wrong here. It's all right. He loves you. Let the truth shine so that you're not walking in any falsehood. You'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. We need men and women who, who love the truth and are seeking the truth. That we get before the Lord in prayer and say, God, shine your light in my heart. How many of you know we can self-deceive ourselves at times, right? It's just that human nature. We need the Lord to shine his light. So many times you're convinced, I'm so right here. And you might be so wrong. But you don't take, you don't, God doesn't want you to take the stand, I'm, I'm just wrong. He wants you to take the stand, God, I just want to get in your light, and you show me. Show me who I really am. Show me who you really are. Truth is coming. It's going to be devastating to some. Devastating if they don't have Jesus. But not to the church, Amen. And not to the sinners. Was it devastating when John the Baptist preached repentance and the publican sinners came to them? It was liberating. The religious men couldn't see it because religious pride is the worst pride of all. We don't want to be wrong. And preachers are the worst of it. I've built my life like this for so long and you're so afraid to realize if they're, if they're wrong. It might be devastating for a moment to realize you're wrong. But you'll know if it's the light of God. You'll know if it's the truth of God. When you're wrong and God deals with you, it will be humiliating. And I'm using that term in the right way. Humiliating. You'll be, you'll be humbled. But you'll begin to feel some liberation. Humiliation is always followed by liberation with God. Always. God shows you that you're wrong. You receive that correction. You walk in the light as it says here. You don't do like John says. You don't say, I'm, I've never sinned. You freely admit, I, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need your help every day. Show me the truth. And the truth comes. And there's a liberation that comes with that. There's not going to be any liberation in this country as, in, in, when people are just fighting for some truths. But the truth. This is why years ago when I first got saved and, 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 and issues like abortion and all that were hit me so hard because now my eyes were open to things. And yet I got involved with some people and even in, in the working of it. And please don't get me wrong, there's a lot of beautiful Christian people that are doing that. This was the early days of the fight for it. And it was, a lot of it was just was, was, uh, backed by a lot of Catholics and sweet people but didn't really believe in salvation. And I'm like, no, I couldn't. I found hard at walking. It's like there's two souls that we're fighting for, the soul of that unborn baby and the soul of that woman. Unless we're going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to these people, I can't be involved. The gospel has to be preached. God wants his light and his truth to come, not just truths.
all the arguing of the transgender things and all like that, we still need to get to the truth of Jesus. And the truth is you're denying God. God has made everyone the way he made them, the way they were born. God makes no mistakes. So as a preacher, I have no desire to get out there and, and, and socially or psychologically discuss it. I want to preach it. God is God. And God formed each of us in the womb. He makes no mistakes. He makes no mistakes. No matter how somebody may struggle, God is able to set them free. Amen. The truth. The truth of it is Jesus Christ. You see, he knew that this is what we needed. Aren't you so blessed when you see that, that, God, that God had Abraham and he gave him the promise? He's like, I'm a God that loves. Here's my promise. But at the time of, of Moses, God had to give him the law. Why? Because he loved them. He knew, I have to give them the law so that they know a way to walk, so that they can see what sin is really like, so that they can be held, as it says in Galatians, by the schoolmaster until when? Till the fullness has come. Brother and sister, I, I, can't, I can't describe enough to, to tell you this morning, today, Jesus Christ is the fullness of God. And he's come. The fullness of God has come. Amen? The revealing of all he is is still coming. He's coming back in all his glory. But for you and I, and for the sinner who will repent, Jesus in his fullness has come. The great joy of the Lord is already here. The excitement of Jesus is here. Amen? It's not a truth that you just get your head around. It's not a truth that's just doctrine. It's not a truth that you study. All those, those are good things. It's the truth of who he is, him, Jesus. But today we have an opportunity to really preach because the pilots of the world are standing there saying, what is truth? And the religious people are outside having turned Jesus over to the world. But you and I can say, I know the truth. The truth is Jesus. Let's go into, go into his presence and find the truth of God. Amen? That's how many of you got saved, is when God came and he dealt with your heart like no one else could do with it because he knows you so expertly. Amen? He wants to free us in who we are. And in our personalities, as I said before, it's never a matter of an ism of saying, well, this is just the way I am. If people don't like it, tough. That's selfishness. But it's also not, not just trying to conform or shut down. It's to open up your heart and say, God, show me the way you made me so that I can walk in the way you want me to walk, Jesus, so I can fulfill what you wanted me to fulfill. How much time is wasted by so many believers? God's created every one of you for a very re a exact reason. He made you in an exact way. Why? For his kingdom. For his kingdom. This is why the conformity of religion that says we'll all be the same is wrong. And this is why the unconformity of it that says we'll just all do our own thing is wrong. It's constantly coming to him and saying, God, send out your light and your truth. Can we pray, God, send out your light and your truth? If this word is true, and I believe it is, truth is coming, what is that going to mean? What is it going to look like? It's going to be devastating to some. But God wants those that are there that say, it's all right. Where are your accusers? You've had five husbands, but you know what? I'm, Jesus is here now. It's like he told her. It's okay. For the tax collector, for the soldier, for all those who are humble enough to hear it. Politically and religiously, America, you see, if you, if you have time enough, you begin to build systems and people don't want to give it up. That's what upset them the most. That's the accusations they brought against Jesus. As they said, he said in three days he'll tear down the temple. Why? Because that was what they loved more than anything. They loved their temple. They loved their robes. They loved their ministry. They loved all the things that they had. That's what we've done in America. We've built our ministries and built our empires and built all these things and everybody's holding on to them so closely. Then just saying, God, just show me where I'm right and where I'm wrong. It's okay. Because what comes into the light, what? Becomes light. Isn't that beautiful? When you take something from the darkness and you bring it into the light, it has an opportunity to become light. God wants to bring things into the light. Not to shame us, 
That's not his heart. And it showed again what that woman, we talked about again and again this morning. He said, where's your accusers? There was no shame because the accusers have been driven away. By what? By Jesus Christ himself. Think about it. How many, how many sinners could come to Christ if they just knew? You don't have to be ashamed of your life. He loves you. You are wrong. You are a rebel. We can't, we can't back away from preaching that. Preachers don't talk about hell anymore. Preachers don't talk about sin anymore. We don't even understand the words fornication and all those. It's, it's everywhere. We don't even bring those words up. But we want to speak those words, but in love. It's such a sinful world out there. That's why God wants us free. He doesn't want us to have one foot of the world and one not. Because he wants us to be able to not be tainted by their sins, but to pull them. Amen? As Leonard Ravenhill so aptly described when he talked about the sinners, it's like we're just standing on the shore while they're all drowning out there. Because you see, they've given up hope. And because the lies are so thick, you and I begin to give up hope. We begin to give up hope because discouragement after discouragement comes. And if we're not careful, we, we wind up walking along the shore while we can barely hear the cries of all the lost calling to us. Because we begin to give up hope and said, no, let's reach out and pull them up. There's always hope. The truth doesn't change. You say, but Brother Frank, it says truth has fallen in the street. That's right. It says he couldn't find one. That's right. It says there's none valent for the truth. But you and I are a new creation. And we can be men who will say, I'll be valent for the truth. I'll be valent for the truth. I'll stand for the truth. We can be ones that will do that. It's tough out there. It's a tough world we're living in. It's not going to get any better. Not unless God really has his way. And that's what we got to keep believing for. Not give up hope. But God wants the truth of Jesus. 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 You know, I learned years ago that I didn't have to, I have, didn't have to be the answer man. Even in ministry, I didn't have to have all the answers. Didn't have to have a psychology degree. But if someone came to me, I could always say, Jesus has the answer. Let's go to Jesus. Go to Jesus. Go to him. Seek him. Get a hold of him. Amen. This is what we need. Lord, send out that truth. God wants to build here at the well. We need to restore. God wants us to be a place where those people are not only pulled out, out of their drowning onto the shore, but they can be discipled. These are the things God wants. But for us, we need to just pause and say, okay, Lord, I want you to send the light and the truth into my heart. I want you to deal with me, Jesus. I want you to have your way, God, so there can be light and liberty. Repentance leads to what? Life. Show me a people where repentance is a way of life. They're being corrected. They have an open heart. They're de disciplined. There's life. There's joy. There's liberty. Show me a people that don't have that. Amen. Show me a family that lovingly really does correct their children. And there'll be life and liberty in those kids. Show me a family where the children are really just put under the law and overcorrected, and they'll lose heart. Show me a family where they're not corrected, and those kids don't have a real joy because they're off, they're off on their own doing what they want to do, and it just brings destruction. But God is not a father like that. He brings real discipline and real life and real love. Amen? This is what he wants. We've got to fight for this. Buy the truth, it says in Proverbs. Buy it. We've often said something that costs nothing, is worth nothing, and it does nothing. Amen? We have a lazy Christianity where it's like I give my tithe, I spend some time with the Lord in the morning, and then I have the rest of the day. It's like a brother told me this week, God, I was dealing with him about the Lordship of Jesus and finances and all. He said, you know, I realized I'm not giving... I'm not giving the Lord just 10%. That's just my tithe is just an acknowledgement. He said, I'm giving it all to the Lord, and he's simply allowing me to use that 90% to live. So we go from just devotions to being devoted to Christ. 
And as I said, I'm not going to stand here and preach where it's like, look, let's build a church and let's just, Brother Frank, dial everything back just a little bit so that people can come in and everybody's, you know, living a decent Christian life. I'm not going to do it. God wants something. I'd be, we'd be lying. You know what I'm saying? What's the truth? The truth is this is a glorious walk. The truth is this. And I have my struggles, true, but I'm telling you this morning, the truth is this is the most exciting, glorious walk there is. I've been saved over four decades, and, and I'm sorry at times sometimes I feel like, well, maybe I'm not deep enough, maybe I'm not smart enough, but I'm telling you, I'm excited about Jesus. This is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. I can still hear the simplest testimony, and I'll break down in tears about someone just saying how they got saved. This is the most beautiful thing that there is. And yes, I've complained about my walk at times. And yes, I've been discouraged. And yes, I've been wrong at times. But when I decide to get into his presence, when the light of Jesus shines, the more I see I'm wrong, the more I see he's right. The more I see I'm weak, the more I see he's strong. The more I see I'm discouraged, the more I see he is the God of courage. The weaker I am, the stronger he is. The more frail I feel, the more powerful he is, the more I see the death around in this world. And the fact that we're all just headed for the grave, the more I see the glory, the glory, the glory of the liberty in the life of Jesus Christ. Amen? This is what the world is afraid of. They're not afraid of some man to get up and doctrinally debate abortion or debate transgender or just debate all this stuff. What they're afraid of is some man or someone that's going to stand up and talk about Jesus as if he's right here, if he's real. They said Paul has lost his mind when Festus, when they were talking, he says, he keeps asserting that this Jesus who is dead is alive. And when they brought, brought John and Peter in, into the, in, in before the Pharisees, they said they had realized they were men who had been with Jesus. How had they been with Jesus? Did they mean that he had been with Jesus before he, was res, before he was crucified? No, I think they realized these men have been with Jesus, even though Jesus has been crucified. It's time that we quit trying to portray ourselves as we're all right. Portray ourselves as, you know, we're Christians. We can saddle up to the world. Let them know it. Man, those people are crazy. Those people are nuts. Those people are out of their minds. Let them say what they want and think what they want. We're headed to a city. Let them see the sparkle in our eyes. Hey, you want to debate this? You want to debate that? You want to debate the environment? You want to debate politics? You want to debate this? Excuse me. My eyes are set on the city. I'm going somewhere. Would you like to come too? See, those are the old gospel songs. This train is bound for glory. But we lost all that because we get too settled down here. We don't have Holy Ghost meetings anymore. But not, not now because God is going to do what God's promised to do. Amen. We're going to open our hearts and we're going to say, God, shine your light in my heart because liberty's coming. Amen. Liberty's coming. Don't, 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 be, don't be ashamed of your failings. Don't be ashamed of your weaknesses. Yes. If there's sin, then turn from it and repent unto God. And let him lift you up. Amen? The truth of Jesus Christ. Mercy and truth have kissed each other. Don't you see that? When truth comes, there's an opportunity for mercy. There's an opportunity to say, there's a way out. When truth comes and exposes someone's heart, I've been wrong. Then there's mercy. Amen? Oh, how we need that again. Let's believe for the backsliders, backsliders to be in our midst who will turn. Amen? For the sinners who will come in and turn. Their sin is deep. This generation's sin is deep. There's no way to, to gloss over it. We can't just put our arms around and say, it's okay, it's okay, before they really see the cross. We've got to let conviction come. It might be painful. They may have to bend down to eat pig slop like that prodigal son. And it takes a real father's heart to allow that to happen. But then God will bring them home, amen? America's fallen. She's fallen far. And she's fallen hard. But there's an opportunity for those who will look up and say, wow, when the light shines, look how far I've fallen. Look how far I've fallen. I can go home. Truth is coming. Will it be devastating? Amen. Will it be glorious? 
there's every opportunity for it to be that way, amen? And this morning, what I want from us is simply as we go forward, and we'll continue next, hopefully next week, but going forward, for what it for us is this, we not be a church that's afraid of the truth, that we allow the truth in our hearts, amen? And the truth is God loves us. The truth is we're a new creation. The truth is there's nothing that God can't deal with, amen? The truth is if you're wrong, then rejoice, because you know what it means? It means God is right. Amen? Amen? See, the Pharisees were always hoping to catch Jesus in something wrong. That's where we live today with politicians and, and everybody out in the public eye and everybody, their world's always waiting. Let me catch you in something that's wrong. That's not our God's heart. For you and I, when something's wrong and the light shines on it, it becomes light. We're children of the light. Amen? Let's walk in that light, and it's going to bring joy. I promise you it's going to bring joy. I promise you it's going to bring peace. I promise you it's going to be, bring strength because you know the truth. You're not going to know it. You know it now because you're saved. Amen? You know the truth. Now, you don't know everything, do you? If you do, get out of my world because, you know, I can't put up with you if you know everything because Jesus is the one who knows everything. But you, you know Jesus, right? So you know the truth. Right? Isn't that, isn't that glorious? The person who's been saved five days knows the truth. The person who's been saved 50 years knows the truth. They both know the truth. And they both can experience the same glory and excitement and wonder and love. Now, God may, may get more out of and more use out of the wisdom of the one saved 50 years. But they both know the truth. You know the truth. And the truth has set you free challenge you to walk in that freedom. Amen? Amen? Quit holding back. Some of you are like, when everything, if I just get this right, if I just get that right, if everything just gets smoother, if this relationship works out, or that one, or in my family this happens, or that happens, or this, we're all waiting. And God says, now the joy of the Lord is your strength. Go to him and let him shine the light in your hearts. Amen? And let's ask God to take this place and not put it under a, under a, under a, a a basket, but to let this place shine and let you shine like a candle and all of us shine like a light into this city. Amen? It'll bring persecution. I've known some real persecution. I can tell you it's not very nice, but I can tell you this. There was always the most exciting times in my Christian walk is when the persecution was the toughest. What exciting times it was because God was on the move. Amen? God is on the move. God is on the move. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning. Please agree with me if your heart is in agreement that we would open our hearts and let the light shine. Not that we go searching around with some flashlight. How pitiful is that? But that we simply just rest in faith and say, God, shine your light in my heart. Shine your light. I leave the rest up to you. Because I'm just going to love you, Jesus. And I'm just going to focus on you. God, shine your light so that our light can shine to others. And this church could shine to others. We thank you that you're the truth, Jesus. And in you, we found our purpose and our passions and all of our promises. In Jesus' name. Amen.